What's up, folks? This is Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. Oftentimes, I hear from different parts of my audience about how the grognards want to hear more about the old games, and the less seasoned gamers want to hear more about the new stuff. Well, today, I've got a topic that should appeal to both sides. I'm going to talk about a game that is the greatest edition of Dungeons & Dragons, in my opinion, and it's not even Dungeons & Dragons. Confused yet? Well, today we're going to be talking about Hyperborea. Welcome to Books, Bricks, and Boards, and if you like what you see here today, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. It all goes to feed that insatiable algorithmic beast, and in doing so, we grow the channel. If you like what you see here and want to continue the conversation, or just pick up some free RPG resources, head on over to Books, Bricks, and Boards University Discord server to meet the greatest grognards of them all. Link in the description. The History of Hyperborea In the mid-aughts, the trolls over at Troll Lord Games had struck a deal with the granddaddy of the hobby, Gary Gygax, to do some work for their Castles and Crusades game. Specifically, they hired him to port his old notes about Castle Greyhawk over to their system. This, of course, for gamers with any historical knowledge, was a huge draw, being that Castle Greyhawk was Gary's original dungeon for his own D&D playtest campaign. To have the works of the master right at your fingertips? That's almost too good to be true. Well, it kind of was. Gary had reams of notes, but he also relied heavily upon improvisation in his games, which doesn't always translate well to a published product. Less so when those memories were more than 30 years in the past. To add to the difficulty, Wizards of the Coast still owned the Greyhawk IP, so all work would have to bear a different moniker. Hence, Castle Zadjage, a play on the backwards spelling of Gary's surname. Eventually, Gary and the Trolls published several different products of the areas around the castle and the upper works. But sadly, Gary passed prior to being able to complete his magnum opus. But it wasn't just Gary's work, as he had several other writers that had taken on various sections of the different supplements to finish out based upon his notes. Most of these other authors did small sections, but one ended up taking upon himself the lion's share of the additional work, and that person was one Jeffrey Telanian. Jeff had a keen eye for mimicking Gary's legendary style of prose, and as a lifelong gamer, he also had a knack for knowing what the ravenous fans of Gary's work were long starved for. Unfortunately, with Gary's passing, not all of the work that Jeff had finished made it out into the wild, as there was a long dispute over the rights between the trolls, Gary's kids, and Gary's widow, Gale. While that seems to have been resolved with some of the re-releases of those materials by Troll Lords Games recently, it does seem to have reduced the amount of Jeff's work that we would actually get to see. But fret not! because Jeff's own magnum opus had yet to be composed. In October of 2012, Jeffrey took the experience he had gained from his decades of DMing a homebrewed combination of BX and Advanced Dungeons & Dragons with several well-thought-out additions and placed them into a beautifully simple red box product, the Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. This product included the spiral-bound referee and player's manuals, each boasting more than 200 pages, a large poster map of the setting, some character sheets, and the requisite polyhedral dice. The game was a reimagining of AD&D cleaned up with new classes and spells, as well as monsters, and a new setting, the world of Hyperborea, clearly inspired by appendix in literature. In 2017, Telanian's Northwind Adventures published a follow-up to the box set, being Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerer of the Hyperborea 2nd Edition. Boy, that's a mouthful. While I never did own a copy of the box set, I did own a copy of this bad boy. At 608 pages, this thing was beefy. It had some great art, some of which were even color plates, and had everything that you would need to play the game in that single, glorious, voluminous tome. While I appreciate a book that can double as a home defense tool, even I found that the practicality of the 608-page version was a little lacking, which is why I picked up and still have a copy of the second edition Player's Manual, which is a one-to-one -one reprint of the player's section of that full 608-page tome. 
but it's in a soft cover book that won't cause your seatbelt alarm to go off when you lay it into the passenger side of your car. You can still pick up copies of the second edition player's manual from the Northwind Adventures web store as of the time of this filming for the absolute steal price of $20. While the first two editions of the game were great and remain 95% accurate to the new edition, I'm here to talk today about the third edition, which dropped the wordy title and shortened it to just Hyperborea. Largely, this will be similar to what was in the second edition of the game, but with a few key changes. Primarily, the referee and player's manuals have been split again into two separate tomes, making them much more manageable. Also, there have been some additions to the gazetteer of the referee manual, as well as some key rule changes across both books. The two biggest, in my opinion, being the reworking of the monk subclass for the better and the simplification of the combat sequence from 2nd edition. Though, if you like the 2nd edition version, pick up the 2nd edition player's manual and add it to your game. With that history lesson out of the way, let's look at how the game plays. You'll be very familiar with the attributes here if you've played any version of the world's most popular RPG. With your standard six, Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, all ranging from 3 to 18. Truly, 3 to 18 in this case, as there are only variations on humans for playable races. No attribute modifiers to be seen. Game over. While this might seem sacrilegious to longtime players, keep in mind that Gygax was not a huge fan of placing the Tolkien races into the game to begin with, only doing so as it would broaden the player base. In Gary's mind, everyone should want to play Conan anyway, so why bother with the elves and dwarves? That considered, if you just have to have the demi-human races in your game, they're easy enough to port in, but I'd encourage you to give this humanocentric version of the game a try before doing so. Even you couldn't say no to that. Back to the attributes, though. While the majority of this section will look very familiar, there are some crucial quality of life upgrades that make a world of difference at the table. Instead of an exhaustive skill system, Hyperborea uses attribute-based tests using a single six-sided die, with success determined by your relevant score. If you have an 18, you will be successful five out of six times, while if you only have a three, you're going to hit the mark a paltry one out of six times. This accounts for all of the standard non-combat but not automatic tasks, but there is more. Each attribute also includes an extraordinary feat section, which uses a percentile roll, with odds being between 0 and 32%, again based upon your relevant score, but also modified by your class choice. Each class adds 8% to one type of extraordinary feat. These feats will come in the form of your nostalgic bend bars and lift gates, but also find their way into feats involving other attributes, such as walking a tightrope with an extraordinary feat of dexterity. These tests and feat provide a simple and effective way to adjudicate player actions without bogging the game down with endless rules for rarely used activities. Brilliant. Classes. Hyperborea 3rd Edition boasts 26 playable classes, each with their own flair and fluff. They are broken down into the traditional four core classes that D&D players are familiar with, being Fighter, Magician, Cleric, and Thief, and then five subclasses for each core class, except the Fighter, which gets seven. One might wonder why you would ever want to play one of the core classes with 22 other takes on popular genre tropes from the greatest stories of sword and sorcery literature, but rest assured, all 26 classes have their own merit, including the core classes. The fighter, for example, gets heroic fighting, allowing for additional attacks against unskilled opponents, as well as an additional weapon mastery, think specialization if you played any version of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and weapon grand mastery, the latter of which is reserved for fighters alone. The thief, in my opinion, is another bright spot, with its D12-based thief skills being much more viable than most OSR thief variations. Across the board, the classes really capture the Gygaxian charm while maintaining a level of care and enough balance to make them all extremely playable. With so many classes, you might wonder, aren't there some overlapping entries? And there definitely are some spots where the Venn diagram meets, looking specifically at you, Huntsman and Ranger. But even in the most clear cases, there are enough obvious differences to not tread entirely upon the role of the other. The total list of classes include from the Fighter, Barbarian, Berserker, Cataphract, Huntsman, 
Paladin, Ranger, and Warlock. From the Magician, Cryomancer, Illusionist, Necromancer, Pyromancer, and Witch. From the Cleric, Druid, Monk, Runegraver, and Shaman. From the Thief, Assassin, Bard, Ligurdabanist, Purloiner, and Scout. While some of these subclasses are definitely inspired by popular multi-class combinations, they are never clear cut-and-paste multi-class stand-ins. They each have their own soul and reason for existing within the world, as well as their own unique abilities and place within an adventuring party. For my money, I'd take Talanian's take on the Barbarian over any other version I've seen, and his Runegraver is a class that I never would have imagined, but upon seeing it, instantly fell in love with. Universal Class Features Classes in Hyperborea follow the much more BX-adjacent levels 1 to 12 rather than the traditional advanced levels that go up to 20. This is probably for the best, as the best D&D is almost always at these lower levels. Aside from that, each class has its own experience table, with the more powerful classes requiring more experience to master. They each have their own hit dice type, saving throw, and fighting ability as well. A particular note here is that the saving throws are for all saves, but each class has certain saves which they get an additional bonus to the roll. This is an elegant way to save space and simplify that process. The fighting ability is the row on the combat matrix where you will find your to-hit rolls. If you're a grognard familiar with Thaco, a fighting ability of 0 is Thaco 20 and each point increase reduces that on a one-to-one -one basis. I know that the Descending Armor class will be a turnoff for some gamers, but I can tell you from experience that my two boys are having zero issues with the mechanic, and they are 6 and 14 respectively. If that's going to be a deal breaker for you, it's easy enough to convert, but I know that there will be some diehards that check out of the game right about here. Alright, for those of you still with me, the casters in Hyperborea will also have a casting ability stat, which is akin to the level of caster from earlier versions of the game, so a caster ability 5 would be casting spells as a 5th level magician, for example. Where this starts to make a lot of sense are in the half-caster classes. So, for example, a 7th level paladin doesn't cast as a 1st level cleric, he has a casting ability of 1. Turning ability is handled very much the same, and that same 7th level paladin would have a turning ability of 3. While this is by no means all of the little quality of life improvements, these are the ones that stick out to me, playing the game. Hyperborea mechanically is going to play a lot like AD&D 1st Edition, but cleaned up without some of the ambiguity. You have D6 group initiative and a combat sequence which goes in the order of melee missile magic movement, and then within movement you have the option to move half speed and then make an attack or cast a spell. Each side completes the whole process before passing to the other. This makes for some decision making without perfect knowledge as you declare your intended actions prior to the initiative roll, which you often miss out on in newer editions of the game. The biggest changes to gameplay are in the margins, with different situational opportunities such as breaking shields, setting arrows, or creating a shield wall. There are many options to make combat exciting and unique, which clearly came from years of playing and discovering these opportunities. Gear When it comes to weapons and equipment, there are enough to make Gary himself blush, with the expected artist renditions included. Each weapon also includes a weapon class, which determines its size and can be used to determine whom acts first upon initial engagement. After all, if I have a polearm, you have to get through my attack before you make your way with that little puny dagger. The different weapons also behave different mechanically in some instances, specifically regarding some of the earlier discussed combat options. Besides the mundane, there are a ton of magical items which cover the expected robes of the Arch Magi to the weird, like radium pistols. When a good referee starts flipping through these different options, their devious minds will be eagerly placing them as bait to lure the players into their next nefarious trap. Of course, when the players start acquiring them, they'll be splattering lots of baddies all over the dungeon's freshly painted walls, so there is a give and take. The Bestiary the bestiary here is definitely inspired by the works found in Appendix N. All of your sword and sorcery or Lovecraftian favorites will be found here, from ape men to the requisite devils and demons, as well as the color out of space, fishmen, and shoggoths from the mythos. This is not the bestiary that newer players will expect. 
given the way that monsters once wonderfully unique have been homogenized over the decades, with even the expected monsters having weird twists. Some examples are the dwarves are inherently evil, the orcs are born of Pict's relationships with demons, and the resident ogres being a form of ape man. There are a lot of surprises to throw at your players with nary a dragon to be found. The setting. Hyperborea as a setting is wonderfully thought out and a reflection of Jeff's detail-oriented mind. It includes fully realized calendars and lunar cycles, including a 13-year cycle which has a full year of perpetual daylight and another year of perpetual darkness, as well as all of the relevant holidays that surround them. Besides these mundane aspects, there are also the more divine ideas of the various deities, which include representations from Greek and Roman mythology, as well as mythos beings and even some nods to a certain barbarian's favorite deity. Um. The variety of divine beings could be haphazardly added as any kitchen sink GM is familiar with, but Jeff took the time to establish just how these different worship practices came about, which is a result of the history of the world. Hyperborea is, after all, a flat world just on the other side of Saturn, far in the future as our own sun is now a red giant nearing the end of its life. The population of this world is from all the different cultures of the old earth, from ancient Greece to the Eskimo and even the Vikings. Sometimes the explanations are vague, but others they are quite precise, such as the Vikings on Hyperborea descending from Eric the Red's lost expedition which landed him in Hyperborea. The totality of the world and the way that Jeff presents it just leaves you salivating for more, the modules. If you still haven't gotten enough after you read everything in the two Mammoth Core books, you have another source of world history and setting building. Each of the excellent modules for Hyperborea provides a more detailed glimpse at the small part of the world in which it takes place, providing a ground look at the places, people, and customs of the different corners of Hyperborea. For pulp fantasy fans, you will appreciate that many of these adventures are directly inspired by specific stories from Lovecraft, Howard, and Clark Ashton Smith, to name a few, but remaining tied to the specific setting of Hyperborea itself. I have PDF versions of the first 10 modules, and there is not a single one that disappointed me, each giving a cohesive story, a good challenge, and frequently some weird twists to call back to the early days of the hobby. Summary. So who will Hyperborea appeal to? Old gamers are going to love its adherence to the tenets of Gygaxian gaming and its wonderfully Appendix N inspired setting and tone. Newer gamers will enjoy the cleanest glimpse into what it was like to play in a game of D&D in those early years before it became ubiquitous in the culture. Everyone can find something to like in this game, be it the mechanics, the setting, or the nostalgia hearkening to a time when the hobby was young and players were much more worried about coin and carousing than about losing your long-form essay character backstory. But that's my take, and I'd love to hear yours. Have you played or even heard of Hyperborea? If you've not, do you think that after listening to my rambling, you would want to give it a try? Tell me about it in the comments section or pop into the Discord channel and join the discussion there. Nerd! 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 Until next time, this has been Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. Good gaming, and God bless.